Good evening. This is Forum Daily for Monday, April 11th. I'm Nathaniel Duick, filling in for Nima Rajan. We start this evening's newscast in BC. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in Victoria today, listing the benefits of the latest federal budget. But he admits more has to be done to improve infrastructure for electric vehicles. Last week's federal budget emphasized the government's plan to transition to a greener economy, including ramping up electrification by expanding the availability of charging stations. The government wants to have 20% of new cars be emission-free by 2026 and 60% by 2030. Well, meanwhile, the latest round of sanctions that Canada is imposing on Russia target 33 organizations in the defense sector. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie says they have all provided support to the military and are complicit in Moscow's unjustified war in Ukraine. Ottawa is freezing the organization's assets and putting prohibitions on entities, including the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and a shipyard. While Environment Canada is forecasting a major spring blizzard will hit southern Manitoba and southeastern Saskatchewan with up to 50 centimeters of snow and winds gusting up to 90 kilometers an hour. The snow will start early Tuesday evening near the U.S. border, then push north throughout the night. Heavy snow will be falling in much of the area by Wednesday morning, and forecasters warn that the higher terrain of western Manitoba and the western Red River Valley could see 80 centimeters of snow. Environment Canada says the storm has the potential to be the worst blizzard in decades. To a gathering storm of another kind now. Not all provinces publicly report data on COVID-19 reinfections, but the ones that do are showing big increases since the Omicron variant arrived. Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer says public health data suggests up to 10% of Canadians who recently had the BA2 subvariant or previously had the BA1 or a previous infection like the Delta variant. Ontario officials say nearly 12,000 people have gotten COVID-19 twice since November 2020, with the current risk of reinfection considered high. Now well, this, as Ontario's health minister, Christine Elliott, says the province will reinstate mask mandates if the Chief Medical Officer of Health makes the recommendation. Minister Elliott spoke shortly before Dr. Kieran Moore's first public briefing since early last month. COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations have been rising to the point that Public Health Ontario has issued a report that proposes bringing back indoor masking. It also recommends extending mask mandates in high-risk settings to mitigate a surge in cases. Well, Elections Ontario is encouraging residents to request mail-in ballots or take advantage of extra days of advanced voting for the June 2nd election. The idea is to keep the crowds down at polling stations for the province's first and hopefully only pandemic election. Elections Ontario is taking the advice of the province's top doctor, as well as looking at how other jurisdictions have run elections over the past two years. And the Canadian Civil Liberties Association wants the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal to protect the rights of Canadians to protest. It's challenging a court order granted to the province last spring that allows the government to ban protests against COVID-19 health restrictions. The injunction was rescinded a few weeks later. A lower court judge refused to hear the association's challenge, ruling it was moot because the injunction had already been lifted. The public inquiry investigating the worst mass shooting in modern Canadian history resumed today. This morning, the panel introduced or released information about David Westlake's brush with death when two Mounties mistook him for the killer and opened fire. The incident happened on the morning of April 19th, 2020, outside the fire hall in Onslow, Nova Scotia. Both officers were later cleared of any wrongdoing. Well, the lobster industry in the Maritimes is enjoying a recent wave of success with increased exports and soaring prices. Stuart Lamont of Tangier Lobster Company says, prices are the highest in commercial history. He says demand plummeted after the pandemic hit, but sales have since rebounded and prices have continued to climb. Canadian lobster exports reached $3.26 billion last year, beating out the previous record by over 25%. Well, good news for those looking for a crunchy snack. Loblaw has resolved its high profile pricing dispute with Frito-Lay Canada and says Cheetos, Doritos, and Ruffles will be back on store shelves by this weekend. The grocery chain says the issue was about providing value to customers. Frito-Lay says it committed to Canadian manufacturing and operations and is looking forward to resuming product distribution from coast to coast in the coming days. Well, the American TV quiz show Jeopardy! will feature a Canadian on tonight's show again. Nova Scotia's Matea Roach will be looking for a fifth straight win. 
The 23-year-old Halifax native pocketed just over $24,000 on Friday's show to boost her four-day total past $104,000. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we'll be taking a look at mental health and budget 2022, an interview with the Canadian Mental Health Association. So stay with us. Budget 2022 was introduced last week and set out the federal government's spending priorities. Among other things, the federal government highlighted mental health. Budget 2022 pro proposes providing $140 million over two years to Health Canada for the Wellness Together, Together Canada portal, while providing continued support from the previous budget. It also pledges $100 million over three years for addiction support. With us to discuss how the budget addressed mental health in Canada is Sarah Kennel, National Director of Policy at the Canadian Mental Health Association. Ms. Kennel, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Great. Thank you for being here. Um, let's take a look, big picture. How did Budget 2022 address mental health needs in Canada? Well, taking stock of the budget in its entirety, as you mentioned, we saw investments in the Wellness Together and Pocket Well app, so a virtual mental health providing service that's being offered to Canadians across the country. We also saw increased investment in the Health Canada Substance Use and Addiction Program and some other initiatives that seek to address populations that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic from a mental health perspective all good things. However, what we didn't see is a, a rollout plan for the promised Canada mental health transfer. And that, in our opinion, is a missed opportunity. Hmm. Well, it's interesting there, missed opportunities in every budget, it seems. Uh, along with the COVID-19 pandemic, communities across the country have been reeling from opioid-related overdoses and deaths. So uh, I know it was mentioned in the budget, there was a special, a special line on opioids. Uh, how does it address addictions and addictions needs in Canada? Yeah, well, what we know is that community-based interventions to address problematic substance use and the opioid crisis are really critically needed. Um, and there's an opportunity in this budget through the uh, Substance Use and Addiction Program to scale up those types of interventions. So we're really happy to see that. At the same time, we do need to see greater federal leadership, uh, you know, when it comes to safe supply, safe consumption. And those conversations have yet to really take off. And that's where we need to see investment and political commitment. Interesting. Now, uh, CMH says, CMHA's recent study, uh, we've got the title here, Running on Empty, How Community Mental Health Organizations Have Fared on the Front Lines of COVID-19, uh, indicates that community-based mental health addiction services are key to the system. So does the budget address the funding needs at the community level with what you're seeing? Not nearly enough. What we're seeing really is um, a rehash of what we've always done, which is fund the public self sector, hospitals, psychiatrists, family physicians. We know these are critical components of the mental health system in Canada, but they're not everything. And we know that a lot of people rely on private insurance and paying out of pocket to access services like counseling and psychotherapy. That's where we need to see greater attention paid and increased investment. And until we do that, people are going to experience barriers and access to mental health. Hmm. So speaking of, of the front lines, what about the frontline workers themselves? Uh, does the budget offer any support for these workers, especially as these services have been in such high demand during the pandemic? Yeah, what we know about community mental health workers is that they're overburdened, they're burnt out, um, and, and really they're facing great pay disparity when it comes to the salaries they receive in comparison to their counterparts in hospitals or, you know, the public health system more generally. And so while investments in Budget 2022, like the Foreign Credential Recognition Program and loan forgiveness for doctors and nurses working in rural and remote areas are incredibly welcome. They aren't, um, you know, the full picture in terms of the type of investment we need to see. We need to see dedicated attention put towards pay equity and also strategies to reduce the burden placed on the community mental health workforce um, that has just been tapped out during the pandemic. And, and we know, uh, you know, not only workers, but, but people across the country have really been seeing a lot of, well, Health, mental health related strain and, and that I believe a survey with UBC that you did CMHA as well, 37% of Canadians say that they are uh, struggling with mental health. Uh, where are they going? Where are Canadians going? Where are individuals turning to for support? 
Well, we know that through this research, about 10% of the population has turned and relied on virtual mental health services like Wellness Together or a CMHA program called Bounce Back. These are incredibly useful for people experiencing mild to moderate symptoms of stress, anxiety, and depression. However, it isn't going to work for everyone. We know that people with more severe mental illness are going to require in-person care. Um, we know that those seeking um, care, about 20% of Canadians said that they just weren't able to get the care that they needed during the pandemic. And that's really concerning. Uh, and among those who couldn't get care, 30% um, of them cited not being able to afford the care because they couldn't pay out of pocket to get it. So the research wow. is significant and the numbers are getting worse. Wow. Incredible. Um, very important conversation. Lots to keep in mind. Uh, Ms. Sarah Cannell, thank you for joining us today on Forum Daily. Thanks for having me. Prince Charles and his wife Camilla are going to make a three-day trip to Canada next month that will see them visit Newfoundland and Labrador, the Northwest Territories, and the Ottawa region. This will be the 19th time the heir to the throne has visited Canada. Governor General Mary Simon says the trip during the Queen's Platinum Jubilee year will give Canada a chance to showcase its diverse and inclusive society and the resilience of Indigenous communities. Joining us now to discuss the royal visit and the place of the Crown in Canada is Dr. Michael Jackson. President of the Institute for the Study of the Crown in Canada. Sir, welcome to Forum Daily. Great to be here. So what do we know about this visit so far? Well, <laughs> what we know is that the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall, as Prince Charles and Camilla, are coming to Canada in May for three days to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, her 70th year on the throne, which is a very historic and record-breaking anniversary, as you can imagine. What we also know is they're only going to three places in this th those three days, Newfoundland and Labrador, the National Capital Reason, and the Northwest Territories. Yes, and, and as you mentioned, it comes during the Platinum Jubilee year. What, what is the significance of the Platinum Jubilee? The Platinum Jubilee is absolutely a remarkable and historic occasion for all the Queen's realms, and that sure includes Canada. If you look at what Canada is now and the monarchs that reigned over us, the only one that has reigned longer than Queen Elizabeth II is Louis XIV of France. 72 years in the 17th and 18th centuries. And the way the Queen's going, she's going to break that record. That's, uh, it's always interesting, uh, the King Louis of France, who would have, who would have thought that far back, but I uh, appreciate it. Um, so the Governor General says the tour will allow Indigenous communities to showcase their resilience. So let's, let's take a step back here, and what is the relationship between the Crown and Indigenous peoples in Canada? Uh, going back even to the 17th century France, the First Nations, Indigenous peoples in Canada, when the European settlers came, like from which I'm descended, um, they made treaties and agreements with the monarch of the day. So we start out with Louis XIV in France and his successors in the 18th century. And then when the British arrived, um, the, the treaties were made with King George III, was uh, issued a royal proclamation in 1763, guaranteeing that the lands on which the indigenous peoples dwelt were their lands and they could only be occupied by settlers on, under treaty and agreement with them. And then the Treaty of Niagara two years later in 1785 confirmed that for the First Nations of that area. And since then we have a series of treaties which are with the monarchs, starting with Queen Victoria and now recognized through Queen Elizabeth II as Queen of Canada. So the crown in Canada is, is not just the person of Queen Elizabeth II, but is also the top of the legal and political system in this across the country. So how central has the crown been to making Canada what it is today? The crown is absolutely central in our Canadian identity. We are a constitutional monarchy. We've been a monarchy of some kind uh, for 500 years. Uh, previous, there were Indigenous forms of government, of course. But the Indigenous people have taken a particular close relationship with the monarch and the ground because it's a people to people relationship it's a kinship relationship and in our system of government the crown is kind of the pinnacle as it was it represents the three constituent parts legislative executive and judicial the monarch symbolically is the head of it all and her constitutional guarantees underpin our system of democratic government in canada 
it's not just uh, democratic life, but as well as government government officials also swear an oath to the queen. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and its its importance as well to governance in Canada? That's right. Um, I, I was a, 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 an officer in the Army Reserve years ago, and we swore allegiance to the queen. We don't swear allegiance to a political party or a government, not even to a flag, not even to a constitution. We sweet, swear allegiance to a sovereign who embodies all that and is totally nonpartisan and removed from the fray. It's an ideal, it's a symbol, and a very powerful one. Indeed. So for viewers who may be wanting to learn more, where can they go to learn or read up about the Crown in Canada? The Canadian the Department of Canadian Heritage has an excellent website under the Government of Canada website, and I would commend that uh, very much, particularly in this Platinum Jubilee. Canadian Heritage and the Office of the Governor General have produced a really spectacular uh, Platinum Jubilee emblem, and they've got made lapel pins available with that and flags. So that's a good source. Our own institute, we've done a series of backgrounders on the crown to make it accessible to the ordinary citizen. And if you Google us, the Institute for the Study of the Crown in Canada, find our website, uh, you'll get it there. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Michael Jackson, President of the Institute for the Study of the Crown in Canada, thank you. It's a pleasure. Slovakia says it has no evidence that air defense systems it supplied to Ukraine were destroyed by Russian cruise missiles. Russia's defense ministry says the sea-launched missiles destroyed four S-300 air defense missile systems near Dnipro and killed about 25 Ukrainian troops. At a European Union meeting today in Luxembourg, Slovakian Foreign Minister Evan Korchuk told reporters that his country is supplying the systems because it wants to beef up Ukraine's air defense capabilities. Well, the World Bank is estimating that Ukraine's economy will shrink by 45.1% this year because of Russia's invasion, while Russia will plunge into a deep recession. The bank's War in the Region report says the war is set to inflict twice the amount of economic damage across Europe and Central Asia as the pandemic did. It says the magnitude of the humanitarian crisis unleashed by the war is staggering. It took a London jury just 18 minutes to find a 26-year-old Islamic State supporter guilty of stabbing MP David Amos to death as he met with constituents last year. Ali Harbi Ali was found guilty of murder and preparing terrorist acts in what the Crown called nothing less than an assassination. Mr. Ali spent years researching and planning potential attacks on MPs and at a trial defended his actions by saying Mr. Amos deserved to die because he had voted for airstrikes on Syria in 2014 and 2015. Meanwhile, the manufacturing hub of Guangzhou has closed itself to most arrivals as China battles a COVID-19 outbreak in its big eastern cities. Shanghai has taken the brunt of the surge. The city of 26 million people is under a tight lockdown, with many residents confined to their homes for up to three weeks. Well, Germany's health ministry says the country may have to discard 3 million doses of expired COVID-19 vaccine by the end of June. A ministry spokesman told reporters in Berlin that not many of the doses have been destroyed so far, though he couldn't give an exact figure. But, he said, we have more vaccine available at the moment than is being used and then we can donate. He added that the UN-backed effort to distribute shots to poorer countries, COVAX, isn't currently accepting donations. Well, it's the end of a political standoff. Shabazz Sharif has been named as Pakistan's new prime minister after politicians from ousted Premier Imran Khan's party walked out of the National Assembly. Analysts say his election will not guarantee a peaceful path forward or solve Pakistan's many economic problems, including high inflation and a soaring energy crisis. But politicking continues in France. With the first round of presidential elections out of the way, the duel starts afresh for incumbent centrist Emmanuel Macron and his far-right challenger, Marine Le Pen. Monsieur Macron faced Madame Le Pen in the presidential runoff five years ago and won easily. But all opinion polls show the leader of the national rally is much closer this time to a potential win. Narrowed down from a 12-candidate first round, the last two standing are to debate on national television next week 
ahead of the April 24th runoff. And disaster hits the Philippines. Heavy rains caused by a summer tropical depression have killed at least 25 people in the central and southern Philippines, mostly due to landslides. Officials say 22 villagers from the central province of Leyte died in landslides. Three other storm-related deaths were reported by the government's main disaster response agency in two southern provinces. At least 30,000 families have been displaced. While well, Amazon is trying to reverse history, the retail giant is trying to overturn the historic union victory at one of its New York City warehouses. In a legal filing on Friday, Amazon claims union organizers and the National Labor Relations Board acted in a way that tainted the results. It now wants to redo the election. An attorney representing the workers group calls the Amazon claims patently absurd. Well, Tesla's CEO Elon Musk won't be joining Twitter's board of directors as previously announced. The tempestuous billionaire remains Twitter's largest shareholder. Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal tweeted the news after a weekend of tweets from Mr. Musk suggesting possible changes to Twitter, including making the site ad-free. Nearly 90% of Twitter's 2021 revenue came from ads. And a 15,000 square foot resort known as the Grouse Nest has been renamed to the Ukrainian Safe Haven. The owners of the resort in British Columbia were renovating the resort, but put those renovations on hold upon learning of the masses of refugees fleeing Ukraine. Local businesses chipped in to help build and get the organization ready, and it is now waiting 19 Ukrainians. This was Forum Daily. Thanks for watching.